Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. What began as an ordinary podcast quickly descends into a tale of madness. Welcome to the Council of Trent Podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And if you couldn't tell, I was riffing on the television show, I Shouldn't Be Alive. So the missus and I occasionally binge watch television shows, and recently we cannot stop watching I Shouldn't Be Alive. It's tales of people who survive insurmountable odds. There's one about a woman who went jogging in Moab, Utah, falls off a cliff 20 feet, shatters her pelvis, her skeleton split into two. She has to crawl for help, and she sends her dog to go get rescuers, and she makes it. So I love these stories about people who overcome incredible odds and survive. And if you know me, I'm always you know into disaster prepping. We've covered that here on previous podcast episodes. And by the way, if you're new to the podcast, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we talk about apologetics, theology, how to share, explain, and defend our Catholic faith, how to share the gospel with the world. But on Fridays, I just like to have fun. I just want to talk about whatever I find to be interesting, and I think you'll find it interesting as well. So today on the podcast, I want to talk about survival strategies. What would you do if you ended up lost in the wilderness? Let's say you were driving your car and you took a detour and you ended up stranded somewhere. You're out in the woods walking with friends. You're just at a national park and you want to go investigate a rock outcropping. And then you look around, all the trees look similar and you can't find your way back. What would you do if you were lost? So that's what we're going to talk about today on the podcast, and I've always enjoyed these kinds of prepping topics. I mean, if you know me, I've done previous episodes on what to do in various disaster situations. When I was a little kid, when I was seven years old, my parents got me a little British SAS survival guide. I think I was seven, seven, nine. I remember that I was, I was a little kid. I was not a teenager yet. And it was a small book. It could fit in the palm of my hand. It was the British SAS survival guide. But I read that front to back over and over again because I was obsessed. What would I do if I was lost? How would I find water? How would I signal uh, for, for help? I remember once I was reading the chapter on venomous snakes. And my parents actually, we had snakes at home. We had one snake. We had a king snake. And he got out of his terrarium. And I was reading the chapter on venomous snakes. And I looked and saw him. But I still freaked out and was like, ah, because I thought that my parents were like, why are you up? Why are you freaked out? What's wrong? I said, I thought it was the Indian Kraken. <laughs> you know, it's this uh, venomous snake from India, because in the book, he looked just like the king snake that I kept at home. So but when I was a little kid, I read that over and over. And so I've tried to absorb these techniques in case something happens. It's always funny. I have all these techniques in case there's a disaster or in case I get loss or something happens and nothing's happened, at least yet, you never know. But maybe the reason I've learned all this stuff is not to help me because I'll end up lost sometime. Maybe you listening to today's episode, you you know, nobody ever plans to get lost in the wilderness, right? Well, a few people do. Some people go just hiking and they want to explore nature more. They want to get away from it all. But most people, they don't plan to get lost or stranded somewhere, but it could happen to you. So one of the tips I might share with you today, it could save your life. So pay attention. Here are the basic survival tips and strategies so you do not become a statistic. All right, here's rule number one. Leave a trail of breadcrumbs. What I'm not going to talk about today on the podcast is how to survive long term in the wilderness. I'm not going to say, well, here's what you can do. You can do all this stuff and you could live indefinitely in the wilderness. That's not what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is to not get lost in the first place. And if you do get lost, get rescued as soon as possible. That is what you want to do. In a lot of cases where people end up stranded in the wilderness or people don't find them, it's because nobody knows that they're lost in the first place. You have a situation where somebody goes for a hike and maybe they go with a friend, but they don't tell anybody else. So they go out on a boat uh, on the ocean and they only want to go out just a half mile or they don't want to go very far from shore. They haven't told anyone they've gone out. And then suddenly their motor on their boat fails or they get lost in the woods. But nobody knows that they went anywhere. So nobody's missing them. So days or even weeks could go by and no one realizes they're missing. But if you tell someone, if you say, hey, I'm going to go on a hike this afternoon. I'll let you know when I get back. I'm going out on the lake. I'm going on the ocean with somebody. Just want to let you know. It's a very simple step, but it's probably something that could easily save your life so that if you're in a situation where you are lost, you can say, okay, someone is coming to find me. They know that if I don't check in tonight, that something has happened and they know the general location where I'm at. That if you haven't done that, 
you could be delayed with rescue, and the longer it goes on, the more at risk you'll be. Or if you don't give people the precise location where you're going, they could be looking for you in the wrong place. So here's an example of that that was actually, it's a I Shouldn't Be Alive episode that was later turned into a made-for-TV movie starring Neil Patrick Harris, of all people, and it's called Snowbound. So Snowbound is based on a true story about Jim and Jennifer Stolpa and their infant son, Clayton. Uh, they're 500 miles from their home in Castro Valley, California, when they lose their way and they're stranded in an endless wilderness of deep snow in northern Nevada. So what happened was that the Stolpas were driving from California trying to get to Idaho for a a funeral for one of their relatives, and they're driving and there's a big blizzard. This happened between 1992, it was like December 30th, 1992 into early 1993. So around New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 1993 is when this happened. So they're driving to Idaho and there's a blizzard. So the interstate has been closed and already they've made a mistake. Instead of just trying to wait the blizzard out and realize maybe you just can't get to the funeral, they decide, okay, we'll drive north. We'll go around where the interstate is blocked. And of course, this is long before map quests or anything like that. Uh, they had cell phones at this time. This is like 1993. Who, who really had a cell phone back in 1993? They tried to use a payphone to let their relatives know that they were taking an alternate route, but they couldn't get through to anyone. So instead of staying on the interstate, they ended up driving north and took kind of a backcountry road to get back on the interstate. And that's one of my rules, by the way, both for survival and to not get eaten by mutants. If you've ever seen the film, The Hills Shouldn't Have Eyes, which is super scary about mutants that attack tourists that leave the interstate, don't leave the interstate. Just stay on the interstate. If the interstate is closed, can you imagine how bad the road conditions are going to be in some little back road or unpaved road in the Nevada wilderness in the Sierra Nevada mountain range? So just don't leave the interstate. But if you are going somewhere, if you're changing your route, let somebody know. The Stolpas ended up being lost in the Sierra Nevada mountains for nine days. This description of the of the TV movie says, they battle for survival against the elements when Jim Stolpa drives too far down a snow-covered road and gets stuck during a snowstorm. Using only meager supplies and resourcefulness, the young couple struggles to keep themselves and their son alive in a frozen shelter while awaiting rescue. Uh, but nobody knew that they had made this uh, hundred mile detour. So they were looking for them in the wrong place. And they also made a lot of other mistakes. They took off the chains on their snow tires uh, when they were going down in a certain area. And a lot of these places when somebody shouldn't be alive, I always say to myself, I, I can't believe they overcame this many mistakes that they made and they still ended up being alive. So they got out of their car. It was stuck in the snow. They couldn't get out of there. They tried hiking forward 20 miles to find an interstate, and it was just desolate mountain ranges. They go back to the car. They can't even make it all the way that Jim's wife, Jennifer, she's injured and can't go on. So she and the baby stay in a cave, and Jim goes for help. He ends up hiking through the snow, and it's 50 miles back to the nearest town, but he's eventually intercepted by a pickup truck by a guy who just kind of lives out in the boonies, and everybody was rescued. The baby was fine. Uh, Jim and Jennifer, the only long injuries they had was that they their toes had to be amputated because of frostbite. This was in the middle of winter in the Sierra Nevadas. And here's how I Shouldn't Be Alive dramatizes their situation. A young family rushing to attend a funeral. Whoa! Take a wrong turn into hell. What is this place? In a desperate fight for their lives, they test the limits of human endurance. With no food, no water, they confront a frozen wilderness. On I Shouldn't Be Alive. First, just as a casual observer, I love the elements of I Shouldn't Be Alive, like the narrator becomes a descent into madness, a journey into hell. And then it's always punctuated by them telling the story what's happening. We just couldn't believe that this had happened. And then you have the reenactments and the actors in the reenactments, sometimes they look exactly like the person who was lost. And other times I think this person doesn't look anything like the person who got lost. Like if I ended up getting lost and they did a reenactment for me, I would, and they did a story about how I survived. I want to have some input on the actor playing me. I'd say, can, can we get somebody? They'll say, we got Shia LaBeouf to play you. Like, um, you know, I'm really more into Miles Teller now. I think he looks like me, and I, I would more prefer him to to do this. And they tell the stories, and always show someone going, "Help us!" Ah! The, you know, adding the the drama and the elements there. So one part of the Stolpa story was that you know they they go hiking, trying to go and get help. 
and they end up getting stuck at their van. We'll end up getting marooned in a cave because Jennifer ends up being injured. She can't hike anymore. And they have their baby with them, their their infant child, Clayton. I don't think he's a year old. He's bundled up in a sleeping bag. And part of me would think, oh my gosh, what would I do in this situation? Part of me would not would not want to separate. I'd say, let's all stay together. Let's go. We're going to go get help. But, but deep down, I would know that I wouldn't be able to cover as much ground with my family in tow, and I would be putting them in danger. Instead, I'd tell them to, to stay where they were. And if I knew rescue was not coming, if I was certain that rescue was not coming, I would strike it out on my own to try to go and get help. But that leads us to rule number two uh, today when it comes to survival. Stay in one place. If you followed rule number one and you left a trail of breadcrumbs, someone is going to come and find you. And so just stay in one place. Odds are, if you try to go and get help while people are looking for you, you're going to be moving further and further away from the rescuers who are trying to find you. That actually happened in another episode of I Shouldn't Be Alive about a guy who got lost in the Australian outback during the summer. He was just a treasure hunter. He was going out and he wanted to find buried treasure or valuables and he gets lost. He couldn't find the rest of his teammates he had gone out with in the in the sorry, the Australian bush. And so he decides, well, if I just keep walking this little way, I'll I'll eventually find my way. But as he walked, he kept getting further and further away from them. And that ended up compounding his troubles. So because I love the show, I, I have to play uh, the intro to, to his story. An amateur treasure hunter's first holiday after life-saving heart surgery becomes a living nightmare when he gets lost in the Australian wilderness. They're not going to find me. You idiot! I was finished. He's at the mercy of a hostile environment, deadly predators, and his own mind. I was actually wishing I'd die. So there is an American and a British version of I Shouldn't Be Alive, or at the very least, they have different voiceover narrators. I prefer the British voiceover narrator because everything sounds classy in a British accent. And so when these kind of cliched phrases get uttered over and over again, when it's a British voice t- saying it, I, I just enjoy it, it, becomes a descent into madness, a harrowing journey into hell. But they've realized they've made their first colossal mistake. The next rule, so we talked about the rules. First, leave a trail of breadcrumbs. Let people know where you're going so that you'll be rescued, uh, or at least people will know to look for you that something has gone wrong and you won't be delayed. Then if you do end up getting lost, just stay in one place. When I was a little kid, they would have assemblies. I remember, gosh, I must have been once again six or seven years old. Maybe this is the reason I read the British essay, A Survival Guide. But we had an assembly where they were teaching us survival skills. The only thing that I remember that was the important thing to take away was that if you get lost, hug a tree. They told us, if you get lost, go and hug a tree. I don't think there was a song, but there is a song in my memory of it. If you get lost, hug a tree. It's that instinct to think, oh, I'll I'll find my way. I'll get there. I'll get there. You should only move if you were like 95% certain that you are heading in the right direction. Even then, you could be highly confident you're going in the wrong direction, and that's just going to compound your troubles. And it's hard. You know, you're embarrassed. You don't want someone to have to come and find you and rescue you. There's a little bit of pride that's involved. But in a lot of situations, people have gone on day hikes and they thought that they were fine and they thought, oh, it's just a little bit more in this direction. And this situation quickly spiraled out of control. So leave a trail of breadcrumbs. If you do end up being lost, stay in one place. And then as you're staying in that one place, you need to prioritize uh, your needs in that situation. So the four things you need to prioritize are shelter, rescue, water, and food. This is my way that I would prioritize it. There is some flexibility in where you would put them here on the scale, but I would say that number one on the scale is shelter. Uh, That if you are lost, you should find a way to get out of the elements, especially if you are lost somewhere where it's not temperate weather, where it's very hot or it's very cold, especially if it's very cold, it's easy to die of exposure very quickly. Let's say you've gone on a day hike and you didn't bring a sleeping bag or you don't have a lot of materials to keep you warm. People can die of exposure or be seriously injured by it very quickly. So you want to be able to come up with some kind of a shelter. You want to try to look around and get under tree branches or a rock outcropping to try to be able to stay warm. Uh, If you have a jacket that's not very well insulated, uh, depending on what climate that you're in, you can get leaves off the ground provided that they're not wet. And you can stuff your pants and your jacket with leaves and other material 
to try to provide some added insulation. Uh, but when you're just out in the woods trying to find shelter, that can be difficult. If you can bring even something small along, you can fit an emergency blanket in your back pocket. It's one of those silver metallic emergency blankets that will retain heat. You can fit that in your back pocket or even a 55 gallon trash bag. If you have a little day, even when you go hiking, you can take a little tiny day pack with you. You'll probably be taking like a few bottles of water. If you could roll up a 55 gallon trash bag, if you're going to take a few bottles of water with you on a hike, take a 55 gallon trash bag. So if it rains, the weather becomes inclement, even if it gets very humid or there's condensation, you can get out of the elements, get out of the wind and get yourself inside of that trash bag. Even just getting out of rain can be a life-saving measure. Uh, but if even if you don't have rain or inclement weather, you could just have very cold temperatures at night. Even if you go hiking in the desert, I used to live in the desert for many years in Arizona. Uh, now in the summer, it's always hot and never gets cold. But in some desert environments, uh, it can get hot during the day, and then the temperatures can drop really far in the night. So having an emergency blanket or a trash bag even to get into, insulation in your clothes, but being able to start a fire, to start a small fire. It, now, that is hard. It is super hard to start a fire without tools. So taking along a few matches or a flint, I'm going to talk about an emergency day hike kit that can fit inside of an Altoid mint tin. You know those Altoid mints? They come in the metallic tin cans, the small metallic tins, you can take even just one of those and fill it with enough stuff to help you in a survival situation, especially if it's only something that only lasts for a few hours or a few days. But I would say the number one thing to prioritize is shelter or rescue. They're at the top of my list. Once again, if you're lost, your goal is not to survive in the wilderness for days or weeks. You want to get rescued as soon as possible. But it may still take several hours or even a day or two for you to be rescued. But here's the thing. Let's say it took 24 hours. Depending on the situation, even if it's really harsh weather or harsh conditions, you could probably make it 24 hours without drinking anything. You can definitely make it 24 hours without eating. Your body can survive several weeks without eating, several days without water, but exposure can kill in a few hours or overnight. So I personally think that shelter is the biggest thing to prioritize, the ability to start a fire. I mean, if you rub sticks together, you can sometimes create friction to do that. Uh, if there, if it's sunny, you could take the lens from your eyeglasses and maybe focus sunlight, but you'd, you'll need to get tinder. You'll need to get something that's easy to set on fire. Uh, so if you have cash in your wallet, receipts, a uh, very, very dry brush, you're going to want to start with tinder and then to get that spark going, and then you'll want to have large pieces of firewood nearby because the tinder is going to going to get eaten up very quickly. So how do you get rescued? Well, if you want to spend a decent amount of money but have a decent amount of safety, you could spend about $300 on a GPS homing beacon. This is more something you would take if you were a backpacker. I mean, I don't really know anyone who takes it on a day hike, uh, but these things are amazing. You, if you get lost anywhere in the world, you can activate this GPS homing beacon, and it sends a signal saying that you need help. It works with satellites, and it can help you get rescued in any remote part of the world. Now, it's not foolproof. You could be hiking, and let's say you could fall into a river. I think some of them are are water resistant, but you could fall into water. It could be broken. Uh, you could lose it. You could break it in a fall. It could run out of batteries. So you don't want to rely on that. You want to have some backup elements involved. But a GPS personal homing beacon, especially if you're someone who likes to go on long hikes or backpacking, if you are a backpacker, I think you should have a personal uh, beacon locating device if you are going out in the wilderness. But simple things you can take with you would be a signal mirror or a whistle. People are coming, even if people are coming to look for you and they know the general direction where you are, depending on the environment that you're in, you're going to be a needle in a haystack. I mean, if you're in the woods, there's going to be hard line of sight, difficult for people to see. Even if you're shouting in the woods or people are shouting, the trees can mess up the acoustics so it can be hard to hear. Uh, if you're lost anywhere else, let's say you're lost at sea, for example. If you were uh, out on a boat, you know, sailing with friends and it got into trouble and it sank and you're on a life raft. Uh, if you have an orange life jacket on, that will help you to be visible. But there's some people who have been lost at sea, uh, scuba divers, for example, who go scuba diving, and then their dive boat floats away from them or leaves them, and they're floating in the water wearing a black or blue wetsuit. And if you're in a black and blue wetsuit floating in the ocean, it's going to be almost impossible for someone to see you. Even if you're in a small dinghy or boat, the ocean is just huge. 
And if you don't have colors that really stand out, if you're in a white boat in the ocean wearing darker colored clothes, your white boat could just look like white caps on the ocean from waves that helicopters could be flying by. It'll be difficult for them to see you. So how do you get them to see you? Well, the best thing you can have with you to get noticed would be a signal mirror. And it doesn't have to be a professional signal mirror. I mean, you can buy those, but anything that's reflective, even if you have a makeup kit with you that has a mirror, something that is reflective on it, if you can take that, even if you have glasses, it's possible they might reflect the sunlight. If you can reflect sunlight, someone could be able to see you from a helicopter even miles away if they're searching for you. And what you want to do with the reflective mirror is you want to hold it up and aim it at the person or the vehicle you're trying to signal and rotate it back and forth, you know, flip it back and forth so that it flashes, so it catches the sun and it makes a kind of flash. I mean, you can try to do a signal, but honestly, you don't have to do Morse code. Morse code is helpful if you're in a situation where you're trying to signal to someone, and that's just SOS, three short flashes or three short blows on a whistle or a horn, three long, three short, But three of anything is kind of international code for I am in distress and I need help. So if you do three signal fires, three rocks that you're you're putting up, if you're just lost, by the way, but making three piles of something is good. But if you have enough space and you're just trying to kill time waiting for rescue and you're not in a dense underbrush, let's say you're out in the desert, for example, you could just spend time provided you're not exhausting yourself. I mean, don't do this in the desert if it's July and it's 110 degrees outside. Maintain your energy. But let's say the sun is set and you still have some daylight. Uh, carve a giant SOS in the sand or take rocks and brush if you're in a clearing and form as big of an SOS as you can. Because remember, if you are just standing there, you're a needle in the haystack. The biggest, the bigger thing that you can make to try to get attention, that's what you want to do. A signal fire and make three signal fires. If you manage to get a fire started, make two other fires next to it. Because someone could think if it's just one fire, oh, it's a backpacker, it's a camper. But if you make three in a triangular formation, people know that is a signal for distress. And to get the smoke billowing, if you, if you get a fire going, a lot of times you'll make the fire, but it won't make a lot of smoke. You need to get like pine, or uh, green uh, tree vegetation. If you throw that on a fire, then you'll get darker colored smoke and that's going to attract people to your location. So back to the signal mirror. If you're flicking the signal mirror, hold out your hand in front of you and make a peace sign. And as you see the thing in the distance you want to signal, put it in between your two fingers that's making the peace sign. So hold it as if you're looking through your two fingers, making the peace sign, and flip the mirror because you're going to see the light hitting your fingers. That's how you're going to know that you're aiming it properly uh, at them. So that's a way to help that you know that you're aiming it. But then take your fingers down so you're not blocking the light. So that helps you to aim to see, yeah, the the light is reflecting in that area, and then uh, flip it back and forth. But the other thing that can be helpful is a whistle. A whistle is going to travel further uh, down land or down water, wherever it's going to go, it's going to attract more attention than just you yelling. And you yelling is going to is going to make your voice hoarse. It's going to use up energy, make your mouth dry. I mean, there's the temptation. You're going to end up yelling if you think you see someone. It's just a reflex. But using a whistle is helpful. And remember, with a whistle, three short blasts. You can do SOS, but if you just do three blasts over and over again on the whistle, people know that someone's in distress. If you're out hunting and you break your leg or something, you get attacked by a bear. There's another I shouldn't be alive about a guy on a mountain who gets attacked by a grizzly bear. He takes his shotgun out and fires it three times into the air. Once again, the signal for distress. So you want to focus on shelter and rescue. And so ideally, if you're lost, you'll get picked up within a few hours or maybe the next morning, and then you don't have to worry about providing for any of the other needs. But if you're out for a longer period of time, if you've got shelter covered, the next thing you're going to worry about is water. And this is important because the human body can only go a few days without water. So dehydration is a real killer, especially if you're lost at sea or if you're lost in the desert where you don't have a lot of water sources around. I mean, if you're lost like the the Stolpa family, if you're lost in the Sierra Nevada's mountain range during winter, you'll have snow that you can eat. But you have to be careful because eating snow is going to uh, make you more hypothermic. So you can't always rely on that as well. The, the ideal thing you can do, and I told this to Laura, I said that they were sitting in their car uh, and they were stranded there with the snow and they're eating snow. I said, oh, they probably shouldn't eat snow. They have cups with them. They were drinking out of cups where they previously had uh, tea or coffee. And these were like ceramic cups. I said, you should take that cup, fill it with the snow, and then use the cigarette lighter in the car 
to warm the cup so that you will melt the snow. That you you don't want to be eating snow in that situation. You'll it'll help you overcome dehydration, but it's also going to injure your mouth a bit and it's going to make you more hypothermic in that regard. But in other cases, you may not have access to water of any kind. You be in the desert, you can be out at sea. In that case, you must resist the temptation to drink liquids that are not good for you. In particular, it's going to be blood, urine, and seawater. And usually it's going to be urine or seawater. If you have already drank liquids and you're urinating, you know, if you haven't had anything to drink, you just want some kind of a liquid, but that's not a good idea because it has urea in it, which is waste. It's going to work your kidneys harder when you're trying to process it. It's going to dehydrate you further, similar to how seawater is just going to end up dehydrating you. You you can't do that. That's signing your death warrant. You have to come up with some other kind of plan. And another plan could be just trying to catch dew and frost. Even if you can't find a river, I mean, avoid standing water, like stagnant or standing water. You're you're going to there's a good chance you could get sick from a, a microbe or some kind of a microorganism in the water. So if you're lost, resist the urge to drink water that you find out there until you realize you're getting dehydrated and you think you absolutely have to, because you don't want to end up getting sick. If you're lost in the woods, for example, avoid stagnant water. I mean, flowing water is going to be better. If you can capture it in a cup or something like that, you could maybe filter it. Uh, there was another episode of a girl who who took off her bra and was able to put it over a jar and used it to filter out some impurities. That that will filter out some things, but it's not going to get rid of microorganisms that can make you sick. So resist that urge. Try to find sources of water that you know are going to be pure. So if you're able to, if you have a plastic sheet, if you're lost at sea, you can take salt water. If you're stuck on a desert island, you can take salt water and make a using a plastic tarp. Uh, you can collect evaporated salt water. That's fine to drink. You could use your socks or fabric to try to absorb liquid. Like wake up early at around 5 a.m. before sunrise. A lot of the plant life and the moss will be covered in dew or frost, uh, you know, dew, condensate. That's safe to drink. If you can soak it up in your uh, on a fabric, then you can squeeze that in your mouth. You could get some water from that. If you're going to be prepared, you could take purification tablets with you, but that's hard. You need a container to mix them in. Uh, I would recommend a thing called a life straw. A life straw allows you to drink water, and it has an amazing filter inside of it that gets rid of almost all those microorganisms and other things that you need to filter out. So when it comes to water, if you realize you're going to be out for, for more than a day, you're waiting longer for rescue, or if you're dehydrated, you have to come up with some kind of plan to to get water in you because you're going to die without water in a few days. But food, you shouldn't be as concerned about. Food is not your biggest problem. You, if you just sat in one place, uh, provided you're not injured or there aren't other ex exigent circumstances, the human body can survive for several weeks without food. And the risks of eating wild food, especially wild plants or berries, are way higher than starvation. So if you're just feeling hungry, don't go out and just eat berries because you're hungry. You're just going to have to get over it. After about three days, when it comes to fasting and starvation, when people are starving, you know, they feel the hunger really intensely at first, but then after about three days, the feeling of hunger goes away and a feeling of weakness or lethargy tends to creep in. But if you absolutely do have to eat and you're going out and foraging, it's hard. If you don't have supplies with you, it's going to be hard to catch animals. Uh, if you are, know you're going out to sea or near the ocean, a great thing to have in a survival kit is a hook and line, but it can still be difficult to catch fish that way. Little animals are going to be hard for you to catch. Don't have this romantic idea you're going to be able to set up some trap and catch an animal. Uh, I mean, that would be hard. If you have a fire going, at least, so when you do catch an animal, cook it pretty thoroughly, and that will give you a good good calorie run. But that that's, that's rare. That's probably not going to happen for you. If you do need food... The best place you could go for are actually probably insects are the safest thing that you could go for. Don't try to go for plants. Never eat a plant in the wilderness unless you're absolutely sure what it is. You have to be 100% sure. And never eat mushrooms. Uh, even if you're absolutely sure it's a, it's a safe mushroom, some mushrooms are horribly poisonous. And they provide such little nutritional value, they're just not worth it. And plants also are, they're just not going to be a good bet. It's going to be really easy for you to eat the wrong plant, even if you're used to survival or if you've read a lot. It's just easy. You think, or there, here's another problem with plants. Some plants, parts of them are edible, but the other parts are not. So some plants, like the leaf, might be edible, the plant, 
but the seed is actually poisonous. This may have been what killed uh, Christopher McCandless. You may not have heard of McCandless, but you probably heard of the book or movie Into the Wild. Uh, it's the story. McCandless, after he graduated Emory University in 1990, he just kind of went out on his own. He hitchhiked, hitchhiked across North America and Alaska, and then he wandered off into the Alaskan wilderness and lived in an abandoned bus there. And there's different theories about why he died, but one of his last entries in his journal, he wrote, Extremely weak, fault of potato seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy. Oh, I remember with McCandless also, he went out there and then he tried to hike back to civilization, but the river that he had crossed previously, it was a tiny stream, the snow had melted, and it turned into a raging river. And so he was now trapped on the other side of this river, so he tried to stick it out there and he went foraging for food. And one of the leading theories, well, another theory is that the meat that he ate was too lean, that you actually can't survive on lean game like rabbits. That's called rabbit starvation. They don't have enough nutrients for you to survive on. So one theory is that he had rabbit starvation. The other theory was that the potato seeds uh, that he ate ended up poisoning him. So that's why if you're lost and it comes to eating, I just don't recommend eating wild plants or berries. If any bird you catch is going to be safe to eat, fish are almost always safe if you're able to get them. Insects, avoid brightly colored insects or hairy insects or ones that have stingers or are venomous. If it, you know, like don't eat spiders, things like that. But if it has six legs and an exoskeleton, odds are it's fine for you to eat. Crickets especially are, are delightful. <laughs> You're just going to have to get over the crunchy and chewiness. It's at least something to, to fill your belly and to keep your mind going. All right, here's our next tip. If you're going on a day hike, take a small survival kit with you. Even if you're going on a day hike, you're not planning to be out overnight, you're just going to go out for a few hours and come back, take a small kit with you. Because studies have shown the people who usually get lost, it are not. it's not backpackers. If you're traveling and you're a backpacker and you get lost, uh, you, you might end up, oh, I'm going to be inconvenienced for a few days or I have to find another way. But you have a lot of supplies with you. You have stuff to work with. If you're just going for a hike in a t-shirt and shorts and suddenly you're out in the woods and it's nighttime and you don't know where you are, you're in a real pickle. You don't have a lot of tools to work with, and you can easily succumb to the elements. A study by SmokyMountains.com says that wandering off trail is the number one reason ahead of injury and bad weather that adult hikers require search and rescue. In the study, survivors' most frequently mentioned source of warmth was clothes. Their prevailing form of shelter was camping gear. Most survivors had a water source, either their own or one that they found. Uh, none of the survivors except one was missing long enough to make starvation an issue. So yeah, don't worry about food. It's staying warm and then getting water, but usually it's just staying warm or avoiding heat stroke if you're lost in a very uh, hot weather climate. But 35% had food they could ration to keep, to keep their energy levels up. All these data points suggest that the best way to survive getting lost in a national park is to already have the clothing and gear needed for warmth and shelter during the night, as well as some food and water. This is not the case with most day hikers who are more likely to bring a camera than extra clothes in a backpack. So if you're just, once again, if you're just taking something with you in a kit and you like going on day hikes, take a life straw, take a 55 gallon bag and an emergency blanket, a plastic bag. Those two things could actually keep you going two or three times as long as a regular day hiker while search and rescue is trying to come and find you. If you want to pack more things in a little Altoid mint tin, if you can just fit it into an Altoid mint tin, you could put in there a hook and line. You could be, you might be able to catch a fish, band-aids, Purell wipes, and medical tape. Because one thing you don't want to deal with is if you're injured, if you've got an injury, you want to be able to patch it up. Uh, and don't take the little fussy band-aids. Take like a decent thing to be able to put over and cover a wound. Especially if you're if you're injured and you're bleeding and you need to stop the bleeding, you'll be glad you had that and some medical tape. Because that's the other thing that you want to figure out. That when it comes to shelter and rescue, you also want to prioritize if you have a life-threatening injury to stop bleeding bleeding, things like that. Uh, in an Altoid tin, you could fit some a flint to start a fire. That you, It's metal you strike together to make sparks or waterproof matches. You could put a small emergency compass in there, some water capsules for purifying water, a whistle to attract help. And remember, the tin itself, uh, you, if it's polished on the inside, the tin would also serve as a reflector device to help people to find you. Oh, and here's one more random tip, uh, just a random tip popped in my mind. If you're lost at sea, worst case scenario, you're not even in a boat and you're floating out in the ocean and you're waiting for rescue. It could have happened. You could have fallen off a boat. You could be on a cruise. And you fell off the boat. Now what do I do? Undo your pants 
and take your pants up out of the water, tie the pant legs together, cinch the waist with the belt, flip it over the water, and if you do that, you will trap air in your pants, and it will make a somewhat makeshift flotation device. It will take off some of the strain for you. So that was just a random one that that popped in my mind if you happen to be lost at sea. All right, so remember to stay put, leave a trail of breadcrumbs, prioritize your survival, and just stay there for search and rescue to find you. Though there may come a point where, let's say you haven't told anyone where you were, or it has been many days or over a week, and you are confident rescue is not coming. Only if you are confident that rescue is not coming should you attempt to go and find help. Although there could be cases where you're with an injured party, and there are people who uh, are have serious injuries, and if they're not treated quickly, they will die. So someone needs to go and get help. And if everyone's lost, what do you do then? Well, the best way to go and get help, if you have absolutely no idea where you're going, Follow water downstream. Most human settlements occur near bodies of water, near rivers. Uh, So if you can follow water downstream, if you're going downstream, it's going to save your energy to walk downhill in elevation. Follow along with the water as best you can. That's going to be, it's not a guarantee, but it's your best bet if you're going to go and to be able to find civilization. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for indulging my disaster prepper inner survivalist. But who knows? This could save your life or the life of somebody you know. It's important tools to be able to pass on to other people. Thank you guys so much. Really enjoyed today's episode. And I hope that you all have a very blessed day. If you like today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit trendhornpodcast.com.